This podcast is produced by Passion Nerdly in association with the Nerds Domain and our parent network, the Southgate Media Group. This podcast could not exist without their support or from support by Patreons like you. For more information on how you can get involved, visit passionnerdly.com. I remember stories from when I was younger, tales of when the Empire grew vengeful and hunted the clans to the point of extinction. There were masters of deception, spies without equal, warriors of extraordinary ability. This is the legend of a brave few who fought to change the course of history and end the time of woe and terror. Our story begins at the Wooden Dojo. So hi, and welcome back to the Wooden Dojo. This is the GM, John, and today I am joined by... Kevin. Kevin. And this is going to be an interesting game. This is going to be a semi-one-shot and also one-player so we're doing a very focused story, but this story will also specifically involve a character that's not a part of our main team. This is actually Kevin's other character, Manabe Saburo. This is actually the basis of our campaign. I mean, before we kicked off the Wooden Dojo, we had a game that is available on uh, for download and listening on Seriously Let's Play, and that is the prequel to this game that is taking place now. And it sets up the whole Sakamoto Echo estate issue and the disappearance of her. And Manabe is a part of the team that dealt with that. So we're actually returning to this character and going to be dealing with other actions that are happening at the same time or roughly the same time as the team that is in the capital city of Daiwa. So there's a whole big team that everybody's been listening to on Wooden Dojo. That is there in Daiwa, and this is another character, Manabe Saburo. And, and of course, this is also, we're, we're doing this over the internet, so we're doing this as a call-in show. So there is going to be a difference in the audio quality, but I think it should still be very good. Kevin, go ahead and tell us a little bit about your character. Give us some description or everything. Yeah, so uh, Manabe Saburo is, um, he's much more what you think of when you think of a ninja, like, assassin-type person. Uh, my other character, Kanojo, is... Uh, not a fighter this guy is pretty much the exact opposite of that he does not talk a whole lot uh he he does not mince words he's a he's a big fighter and uh assassin and uh he's kind of short uh he's real thin and uh wiry he's uh he's got a real uh serious expression on his face most of the time you know a loose fitting coat but very tight fitting clothes other than that and uh, carries a katana, and uh, for this one, I've, I've got a, a longbow, a Yumi, uh, just in case I need to do some stuff from range. But uh, that's it, as far as this physical description. All right. And this character is also the only character in our in either party that is a member of the Recoiling Serpents. And for those of you who are new to the Ninja Crusade, and haven't heard anything about it by you know not either not listening to the prequel series or really not knowing the game itself. The Recoiling Serpents are kind of what you hear in the name. They are a group of ninja who their powers and their personalities are very much serpentine. Uh, a lot of their powers center around kind of snake aspects, I would say. And they are also the largest clan in the whole Ninja Crusade. Uh, so big, in fact, that we're going to be entering into the area of, uh, of this world that is controlled by the Recoiling Serpents, which is actually known as the uh, Triumph. Uh, there are different districts, different provinces, and this is the Triumph province of the Empire. It's the largest province, and it's also, strangely enough, the province that is uh, contested. There are a lot of imperial troops here, and it is very, very close to the hidden area for the ninja in Danketsu. It is not very far at all. Uh, It would probably be a very short travel 
from one of the most embattled cities of the Triumph Province to Danketsu. So, we're going to go ahead and start this story off. So, when last we left this group of heroes, Manabe Saburo and his teammates had boarded a boat and left the shores behind, escaping with Sakamoto Echo. It was in your character's company that she fell ill, and you were assent- you were escorted by the rest of your team and uh, one of her handmaidens. The other handmaiden remained behind with another member of your team, which will be another story coming up eventually. So you escape across the sea and make your way back to Denketsu, all the while Sakamoto Eko's health is failing. You watch as the healer of your group just battles this poison that is coursing through her. And it's one of those things where your your clan knows quite a bit about poisons, but this is not one that you are familiar with. So it, it is not something that you have been able to help out with. But you've watched the, the healer of your group uh, attend to her and assist her and nurse her back to health. And while you are in the village of Danketsu, the, uh, your clan, the Coiling Serpents, a call goes out for a conclave that something big is happening that affects all of you. And there is a meeting that is going to be held at a secret location known only to your clan. So you gather your things up and depart to the Triumph District. Traveling into the Triumph District, this is a very odd location because when you think Triumph, you would think uh, certain ideas come to mind. Maybe that it was a verdant area or beautiful or that maybe there are roads and streets that are paved and there's a certain air and uh, significance to the area and nothing could be further from the truth when it comes to the Triumph province. Instead, this is an area that is very embattled. It is not impossible when traveling through the area of Triumph province to either run into groups of ninja or to run into Imperial troops, both of which moving about, fighting each other in skirmishes. There are trenches, there are uh, fortifications, and there are also swamps. Lots and lots of swamps with poisonous you know, vipers and other snakes that are there. You also have a lot of people, uh, citizens of the Empire living in this area, that are very hardy. You, I mean, the, uh, the common person of this area has grown up exposed to the swamps, exposed to these, uh, you know, the, the poisonous creatures and everything else. And they are nearly immune to disease as well as to all the other problems here. They are a tough, tough people. And they get along pretty well with the ninja. And to some extent, they are willing to get along with the empire. For the most part, they just turn a blind eye to the whole conflict because, quite frankly, it's not theirs. They don't want to get involved. But you manage to travel your way through, avoiding patrols and everything else, along the way meeting up with several other groups of the Serpent Clan. And you find your way to one of the hidden little bases on the outskirts of Triumph Province. And it is a large group. You essentially arrive, and there are over 200 other ninjas of the clan there. Members of every rank and group possible. Some of them represent larger troops that are scattered throughout the area. Captains of groups, sometimes numbering up to 50 ninja. One of the primary figures there is an individual who they just called Old Snake. And he is considered kind of one of the leaders of the clan. The clan doesn't have a primary leader. It doesn't have a central figure. It has kind of a loose democracy where everyone listens to their elders. It's almost like almost a mob rule kind of thing. But again, they defer to those who are they consider worthy of their respect. 
The old snake is this older gentleman, wizened looking. It looks like age has shortened him a little bit. His shoulders are hunched, but there is a strength and a stature to him. There is, of course, the common trait to your clan, which is that your skin takes almost a serpentine scaled appearance to it, making your skin kind of supple, very flexible. All over his body, you can almost see scales with a kind of white tinge to it. He has lived a very long time for someone who is a warrior and a member of a warrior clan. And he wears very simple clothing, but there is a certain air about him, an air of kind of nobility, but at the same time, an air of danger. As if there is a reason that people possibly call him the old snake. It's like there is something about him that this tells you that he is dangerous. And so he's kind of a, you know, in your clan, that would make him a figure of respect. He just moves kind of through the crowd and people part in front of him. Uh, Occasionally, a few of them bow. He does pass by you. How do you react? Uh, I'll give a, a short bow to him as well. He briefly looks your way and nods. And everybody moves into a large central hut. It uh, looks like this has been cleared out and made recently. It's thatch exterior, uh, a few poles that have been put up, large fire in the center that illuminates the entire area. And most people just come in and sit directly down on the ground. The center of this structure is open to the sky allowing the smoke to depart. It is quite a sight to see this many of your brethren gathered. The elders walk forward to the fire, holding out their arms. The old snake addresses the entire group. I'm glad that all of you were able to come and join us here today. It has come to our attention that one of our allies may have betrayed us recently. A family and a group that has aided us in the past. Specifically, these charges are brought by one of our own. And he looks to the exterior of the building and calls out, Onimaru, come forward and present your evidence. This is a name that you are familiar with. Onimaru is a kind of an up-and-coming star of the clan. He is known for being of rank. Many ninja follow him, and he is known for leading some of the most brutal campaigns against the Empire on behalf of the Recoiling Serpents. Legend of his level of power and accomplishments are just well known. But looking at him, it's one of those things where he is not what you'd normally expect. He is very lithe, very skinny, very tall as he walks into this gathering. He wears a very simple white kimono, long, dark hair, partially covering his features. But again, that air of menace. Different from what you get from the old snake, but still that feeling of this is someone to be wary of. But he strides into the tent and stands opposite of the old snake on the other side of this fire pit. And he looks around the room and gives a deep bow. I have come here because I have heard that one of our allies, yes, as it was pointed out, the Hanos, have aligned with the Empire. For over 20 years, this family has aided us, giving us information on Daini Ryoku. This is, of course, one of our chief locations that we have tried to overthrow many times before and very bitter and embattled position. Many of the times that we have been successful, it has been passed Ben by this family. And so I do not bring these accusations lightly, but I bring them anyway. And he nods to his left, and another member, more likely one of his subordinates, walks forward and carries a stack of papers, walks around the fire, brings them over, bowing deeply and handing them to the old snake. The elder opens them up and looks them over and then looks back at Onimaru. And Onimaru continues. These letters are correspondence between both the family of the Hanos and also the Empire, specifically the Emperor himself. If you look 
at the seals upon them, you will see that these are the signets of both these families. These are not things that can be faked. These are not things that can be manufactured easily. If you look through them with your eyes, Lord Snake, you will see the truth of my words. The elder is looking over the papers. He opens them each up and looks at the seals that are upon them. He sets the papers down next to him and nods. What Anumara says is true. There can be no doubt. The Hanos have turned against us. And there is a murmur and a hissing that moves through the audience. One of the primary actions or primary things with the uh, Serpent Clan, one of your triggers for your group. Do you remember what it is? For the Recoiling Serpents, it should be when you engage in revenge against your goal and to your detriment. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So, as he said, with the Recoiling Serpents, they have a trigger that is called Rattle, Then the Bite. And this trigger is, the way it's worded in the book is, revenge is not just part of their teaching, but a way of life for the recoiling serpents. Unanswered wrongs or crimes against them burn to the core of their being and drives them to pursue vengeful actions, even when they are not practical. This, of course, gives their characters certain abilities and everything else. And the gift for your character is the, that the serpent gains one karma when they engage in revenge against the party's goals and to their detriment. Now, obviously, this doesn't exactly feed into that situation, but this definitely feeds into the behavior of the serpents. Hearing all this, how does your character react? So, uh, Saburo, if if the listeners have listened to the uh, original podcast with him, he was, he kind of, you know, was the big guy there. Uh, But here, he's with his own people. He considers these people, like, actual equals. So, um... As he's kind of a small fish in this one, but he wants to change that. So Saburo is going to, like, jumps up. Saburo steps out into, I guess, there's a row or something that people have been walking in and out of, and he's going to say, these Hanos a lesson, and I think it should be me. There are echoes throughout the chamber. I mean, when you do this, people are just like, yeah, to teach them a lesson. All sorts of things cut their eyes from their faces, cut out their tongues, rip them to shreds other members of the clan step forward also demanding the right for a revenge against this family the old serpent however just with a quick motion holds both his hands up quieting the crowd Uh, a almost instantaneous hush uh, this falls over everyone in respect revenge is necessary it calls to each and every one of us And we know what our duty is for those who turn and strike at us. We strike back harder and fiercer. He looks across and says, Onimaru, I take it that you have some sort of idea? And Onimaru nods and looks across the crowd and looks to each person who has stood up and offered their aid and their action. His eyes briefly fall upon you, and he nods to each of you. I know that the Hanos have recently departed from their home and are traveling in mass on the road on their way to the capital. Their caravan is moving slowly, so we will have an opportunity to catch up with them. We will take them on the road and we will destroy them all. Not one individual will be left alive, and they will know our vengeance. There are looks around the room. I mean, people are nodding. Yeah, everyone's like, yeah, yeah, this sounds right. This is, this is, this is what we do. Your character, how do you feel about this? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm on board for uh, finding this caravan and uh, killing the, the lot of them. The old snake, this kind of nods and go gather those forces that you so choose. Strike and strike quickly. We look forward to evidence of your victory. Onimaru bows deeply and then calls out, Those of you who wish to join me, those of you who stood, meet me. Meet me just outside of the Anima. There is a enclave there where my forces gather. Make your way there and we will strike together. And he departs. The old snake then says, 
This is the main issue that we are going to be discussing. If you wish, you can remain. We have a few other things to discuss amongst the elders. It is not often that we have all of us together in such numbers. Otherwise, depart back to your battlegrounds and be prepared for whatever decision or action the Empire will do as revenge for such an act. At this point, the gathering breaks apart and many of the members here depart. Uh, some kind of form up and gather together. Is there anything that you'd want to do while you were here? Let's see. I'm, I'm trying to think if uh, I could find someone who is, I mean, where the requirement servants, if I could find someone who's like really good with poisons. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And tell them uh, about uh, Sakamoto Echo's poison and see if they know what it is. There are several members here who practice different ways of the snake, uh, which is one of the uh, roads and one of the styles of fighting amongst the clan. And so it very specifically uses poisons and also develops an immunity to it. So as such, they are exposed to just about every poison the Empire has seen. They listen to your tale and uh, the description of it. And one of them actually is like, I actually think I've heard of this poison. It's not from within our borders. That is a poison from the land of Seed and Blossom. It uh, is a very, very slow poison, but it leads almost always to death. Whoever your healer is in your group, they must be quite accomplished. It seems. Hmm. Um, to doubt to this. Hmm? What was is that? there any antidote? Oh, am I breaking up again? Oh, no, no. Um, okay. Is there any antidote to this poison? None that we know of, but if your healer is managing to counteract it, that is very impressive. But any other answer to that would be in the borders of that land. That's a, and that is a land far to our southeast, I believe. I might have to change that. I, I'm pretty sure that's where it is, though. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, I don't have a map in front of me either. Uh, okay. Well, uh, yeah, that's the only other thing I can think to do besides uh, just go meet up with my modern. Okay. As, as much as, as I would like to hear what the others are saying, uh, Saburo is not super interested. Okay. All right. So your character departs. Uh, probably you go ahead and stay the night there. Uh, yeah, I'll stay the night and, and meet up with them. I guess I'm supposed to meet up in the morning. Yeah. Uh, well, Yanoma is a uh, village that is not really much of a village anymore. It's on the west coast of this province, so you're going to be traveling for well over a week to get there. Okay. Uh, and it is... It once was a very well-to-do village, but the war has seen this... It, it basically just come apart. There really aren't any... Uh, there are still people that live there, but the government has fallen apart. And you've actually heard a uh, discussion of Yanima. Uh, go ahead and let's see. I'm just going to go ahead and say, uh, yeah. You remember that one of the families, uh, one of the groups that had attended the uh, meeting with Sakamoto Echo... You remember that one of the families that present was a group of nobles, or a noble that had been uh, displaced from Yanama. Okay. And so, just an odd thing that rings in the back of your mind was that, huh, this is the second time this has come up, kind of. That's this odd. But you, uh, in the next morning, wake up, and depart. There are several members of the uh, Recoiling Serpents that were present that are traveling as well. You find a group of about 
10 to 16. I mean, it's a it's a pretty sizable group, and they they're all willing to travel together, uh, working together, ambushing you know imperial guards along the way, small patrols, and you make your way uh, northward, northwestward to the outskirts of Yanima to meet up with Oni Mara. You travel through, you know, across trenches, areas where that have seen great battles, swamps, rivers. I mean, you this you see the swath of this province, but this is also your home province, so you are very familiar with it. And the numbers that you are traveling with, there's really nothing that poses much of a threat to you. So... You travel beyond, and one of the other members of this group know exactly where this con- this little enclave is that you're going to be meeting up. You arrive, and it's a kind of a kind of a swampy area, but one filled with uh, equivalent of mangrove trees, just roots gnarled and trees very close together. Uh, for anyone else, it would be very hard to move through here, but it, it's like with a serpentine grace, all of your band just almost meld into the trees, moving through the area, uh, going deeper and deeper into this copse. And eventually it opens up, and you find yourself in a large group of other recoiling serpents. You would say that here there are probably close to 60 members. And most of them show signs uh, basically of a symbol of a fang dripping uh, venom. And this would very much denote that they are members of Onimaru's group specifically. Uh, the moment that y'all arrive... There is a call whistle that sounds out, and everyone stands, and Onimaru strides out of one of the tents, and he looks amongst the group. You are the ones who have come. Very good. I appreciate your bravery and your willingness to fight. We will depart tomorrow. We will. We have an idea of where we can ambush the uh, the caravan. We will set our traps and we will be ready. Enjoy your time amongst your brothers and sisters here. And he this goes right back into the tent. But uh, the, the members here, seeing all of you, uh, you're giving actually a very warm greeting. Much more warm than what you got at the uh, at the large conclave. They walk up, they embrace you as, as brothers, thrust a bottle of sake into your hand, and invite you to their fire. So, is there anything that you're going to be doing here? Um, I'd like to see uh, the earth. Many of these guys have been to Denketsu and what they think about this whole cooperation with the other ninja clans and everything like that um and because i know we're we're sort of loners among the ninja oh yeah no uh yeah a couple of them you know the vast majority of them do not appreciate uh dan ketsu they are they're like we really have no intention of being there we are Everyone, you know, knows that the recoiling serpents are the largest and strongest clan, and we are their fangs. And that's that's pretty much the way they they phrase it. A couple of them, uh, like one or two of them, when you mention Dan Ketsu, spit on the ground. I mean, they have a strong distaste for the Lotus Coalition. So, uh, is there anything else you're going to be doing? Um. Hmm. I don't think so because I, I think I still have that uh, that uh, damage poison. 
uh, yes. that I, I made in the first uh, the first game. Because I used the knockout poison, but I don't think I yeah. really used that damage poison. So I've still got that. I don't really feel that making more poisons would, would help me a whole lot. Okay. All right. So the uh, next day, uh, everyone gathers together, and you move in mass out of this copse of trees and to the northeast. Uh, Onimaru actually kind of takes the lead, walking ahead of the group and guiding all of you to probably the, uh, one of the driest patches in the area. And obviously, this is a road that uh, sees travel. This is where the caravan will come through, my spies have told me. So we will prepare here. I think that... Hmm. He kind of rubs his chin looking around the area and walks a bit. We'll set up two flanking attacks to take out the middle of the, ca- middle of the caravan. I will need a few to join me. I will handle the troops. My understanding is that there are Imperial Guards who will be guiding and protecting the uh, caravan at the head. So I will handle them with my select few. The rest of you will attack the main caravan. I understand that there are a few members of the Imperial Army that are riflemen. And I do believe there are a few members of the Golden Lions in their number. He says that, actually, with a chuckle. Of course, such things are not threats for us. Kill them, and kill the family when they arrive. But wait for my signal. There are plenty of opportunities to hide yourselves here. Create whatever traps and whatever illusions you need but we will strike when they arrive and everybody nods and they set uh, to their tasks it looks like a group him and about three other members uh, begin to kind of work the ground at the head of the uh, at one section of the road uh, digging it up removing some of the dirt and a few of the others, uh, majority of the others, spread out through these tall reeds and grass and kind of make uh, kind of a ghillie suit, you could say. They essentially pull up sod and strap it to clothing and you know make some holes in the ground that they can hide in, little uh, foxholes, and cover themselves and cover the area up with the dirt. Uh, what are you going to be doing? We uh, we can't see the the caravan yet. No. It's, it's okay. uh, does does Anamaru, did he give any indication as to when that would be coming by or just soon? Uh, he really didn't give any indication. It could be could be an hour, could be hours. Um, to. Uh, to start any jutsus yet. Um, just, uh, it's a common thing with me, apparently. Both characters have it. But, um, so I, I'm kind of planning on using that to just, like, stand right by the road um, and start killing stuff. Um, but I think for now, let me uh, join the people who are, are um, tolls and, uh, and sort of concealing themselves that way. Okay. And if I want to change it up towards the end, I'll, I'll pop out and, uh, to uh, the unnoticed. Uh, so you set about do, uh, the foxholes and preparing out there. Uh, all told, I mean, this is... Imagine 47 ninja preparing, digging, getting themselves ready. And by the time everyone is concealing themselves, it is as if nothing was out of place. You disappear into your foxhole uh, with just the slightest visibility, a little bit of a hole or a slit in the, uh, in the sod that you can watch from. Looking out, you are there for a couple hours 
waiting and watching. But then you begin to hear uh, that that kind of a rumble, the sound of footsteps moving in unison, the sound of you know carts and carriages, uh, and you know that the caravan must be approaching. As you are sitting there, you hear uh, from one of the other foxholes nearby, Wait for Onimaru's signal before we do anything, brothers. We will take them by surprise. And you see eventually the caravan, uh, probably about 100 yards away, approaching, uh, using the main road. There are about 20 members of the Imperial Guard leading this procession. They uh, dressed in armor, They're kind of a very ragtag look to them. They've, they're coming out of the swamps, so they are dirty, they are a little bit mucked up, but they look very disciplined. But this is the first group, and it proceeds ahead of about two wagons and two carriages. And alongside these carriages, you do see other members of the Imperial Guard, and the, uh, some the armor on a few figures catches the light just right, and there's a kind of a goldish gleam to it. And you know, ah, yeah, there are definitely some golden lions amongst them. And at the same time, there are a few, you know, probably a few this mercenaries amongst the group. But they all proceed. And you watch it. I mean, it, it, it's that feeling of adrenaline that begins to course through your body. And this is probably the moment uh, where you're going to want, if you have any jutsus that you want to kick off preemptively before the combat starts, this would probably be the point where you'd want to do it. Um, I think I'm good. I think what I want to do is I want to apply uh, some of that damage poison to an arrow. Okay. Um, I'm going to be having my my bow out at the first of this. All right. And so, I mean, just the adrenaline coursing through your body, but you're remaining, you're staying vigilant, and you're disciplined. And you can feel the air kind of crackle with energy from different areas around you. You know other members of your clan are beginning to activate some of their jutsus, pulling some of the ki uh, into their body. And the uh, you, you get a feeling like uh, you see uh, on one of the carriages there's a member of the Golden Lions. And it's like he's looking around as if uh, some, he, he realizes something is out of place, but the caravan, he's not doing anything. It's like the caravan is still moving on. And they're all of a sudden the horses, like it, they're the first to realize something is happening. And the horses on the lead part rear and kind of shift and buckle and that all the carts come to a halt. You know, the two car- the two carriages and the and the, the two wagons just halt. And the troops are still kind of moving ahead. And y- you watch from the slit as it's almost like the ground that they walk upon becomes quicksand. It's like their their feet begin to sink into the dirt there in front of them. And they stumble and they trip, but there's something more to it. It's as if, uh, imagine the reaction a person has to an earthquake, to a shaking, where they begin to stumble around. Uh, They're losing their balance. And you now are noticing that it's more than just quicksand. There are things moving through the soil. And these things become visible. It is serpentine. It is scales. It is the colors of crimson and black and brown. And these are large snakes that begin to encircle all of the guards at the head of this caravan. This is what they have walked onto. This is the trap that has been set. And they begin to sink into this dugout area, screaming and shrieking as these constrictors, large ones, begin to basically bind them and bite them. And in the midst of them, you see a serpentine form emerge. 
And it is, imagine a half man, half snake, but with the visage in the face of Onimaru. And he looks out at the caravan. The Basically, the, the people left. Because uh, at this point, with the aid of his creatures, 16 Imperial Guards just went under the soil and are being killed and crushed. Their screams filling the air, but his war cry calls out over all of them. And he holds out a sword to his side, but just imagine this serpentine form where from the waist down, it is a large snake. And you hear his war cry, and a war cry is echoed from all around, from every foxhole. And you feel this feeling, you know, just of anger and rage and pride filling your belly. How do you respond? Uh, I give a war cry too, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pop out and and pop off a shot because. Uh, round. Okay. Uh, is there anyone in specific you're gonna be trying to shoot? Uh, I'd like to target that golden lion who was driving the cart. All right. So uh, at this point, marksman is going to be your main uh, skill that you're going to be using just because it's the bow. But uh, you actually have an opportunity to use a couple different ones, uh, different other skills to add to that. Uh, you could go for discipline, deception, stealth. How, how would you like to do this? Uh, I think I think speed might be good because I've, I've tried to jump out ahead of everything. Okay. All right. And remember, uh, descriptions, uh, you know, the more description you give, the, you know, it can add a dice to your roll. So uh, did, did you want to describe that in any specific way or you just want to go for it? So uh, I'm going to, uh, is yelling, I'm going to pop out, roll forward with my bow. Uh, and I'm going to get a rare back, um, let off a shot at this uh, this golden lion who uh, was seeming to notice us, but uh, uh, make sure he doesn't get get too uh, too quick on that uh, carriage if he can try and go forward. Okay. Um, yeah. So. All right. So go ahead and plus. add that uh, plus one to your uh, total. So how many dice are you going to be rolling? Okay, so I got two for Marksman. Mm -hmm. I have four for Speed. All right, so that's six, and plus one is seven. And uh, do you want to... uh, Let's see. At this point, you could use your key, or you could use... uh, Oh, what's the name of the other one? Karma. Karma. Uh, you're the only one present, so essentially you only have one karma, but you could go ahead and use that as well to go ahead and add to your attack. I'm going to hold off on it. Okay. Because uh, I also get a plus one speed when making a surprise attack. Ah. So I, I'm going to I'm gonna just go with these dice. All right. Uh, uh, that is six successes uh, with one boost. Uh, and the... the uh, so did, did that include the did that boost was that included in there? Yes. All right. So that I got two eights, two nines, and a boost. All right. So six total, uh, and this was also with the poison. So I'm going to say it's at seven uh, successes. All right. And let's see here. I don't think he's going to be able to react in time, but we'll go ahead and give him benefit of the doubt. One second there. And no. Uh, yeah, your arrow strikes true, striking him directly in the side, right below the arm, uh, sliding in, and he uh, kind of buckles to the side and falls off the wagon. So uh, you're not certain entirely if you killed him, but that is that would have normally killed any other man. So, and from all around you, other members of your clan, this emerge out of the ground. Uh, arrows, shuriken, 
other throwing implements, even axes, are being thrown through the air and striking targets. This is brutal, brutal combat. People begin to draw swords and run out, uh, you know, from the caravan, trying to strike. Uh, a few shots ring out. You did come out of the ground, so there are going to be a few people. Uh, there are a few riflemen on top of the carts on the caravan, and they are going to try to shoot at you, or at least one is. Uh, there's so many targets at this point; they are kind of reeling from the interaction. Uh, and so that is going to be uh, four. So uh, if you want, there are you can either go ahead and try and dodge this attack. Uh, but that will essentially, uh, oh, we need to, so from here on forward, we're going to need to go ahead and roll your dynamic actions. Um, so, uh, go ahead and let's get that taken care of. So we know how many actions you have around. We've got three dynamic dice still, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I do not get any extra. Maybe All right. So you have one action. So you could use... Uh, there's two things you can do here. You can either spend a key and negate half the damage. That is one thing you can do. You could uh, spend a key and use that uh, if you have a power or other way to uh, try and knock that down. Uh, I think you can use a karma, possibly... But the other thing you can do is if you want to use your uh, one dynamic action to go ahead and dodge, you could. Otherwise, it's going to be four damage. Uh, and the way that damage works in this, because I don't know that I've ever actually taken any damage. Yeah. Um, would that get all four of my lowest health? Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, it's a, a, no, you never know how these things work. Um, can I can I try to dodge it? Yeah, uh, you can. Uh, okay. So dodging is going to be a simple, you know, this is a get out of the way action. So you could use speed, you could use athletics. Uh, those are going to be. Um, I think speed and athletics is going to be my best bet. Okay. Uh, because of my step board thing uh, in my background, I get a plus one speed when dodging. So I'm just, I'm. Just, okay. Four, five successes. Got right. three, seven, seven. Okay. So you dodge out of the way, and uh, that will essentially uh, keep you from getting hit. Uh, at this point, members of your clan are rushing past, uh, just engaging in melee combat. And. Sorry. Uh, engaging in melee combat. There are all sorts of things taking place all around you. There is, uh, at this point, uh, Onimaru even, he leaves the pit of snakes behind and his form just walks forward. Uh, it's kind of an amazing thing. This is things you've known your clan can do, but you've never seen actually done. Uh, his mouth disengages the jaw stretches open and you watch as a fully formed fully healed onimaru uh in a human form comes out of this snake body and he's you know clothed carrying his sword and just strides off you know and this what what is left behind is essentially this husk and it is the serpent skin and what's left of this body. And it's, a, you know, it is just, uh, it, it is terrifying and it is intimidating and it is amazing because this is something that you one day hope you can do. Uh, but essentially he just is walking forward and now he's engaging in melee with what is left of the guards at the front of this uh, caravan. So uh, go ahead and roll your dynamic actions again. Uh, I got a boost, but that's it. So. All right, but that's uh, that, that'll give you two uh, additional dynamic actions. You have three this round. Awesome. 
So uh, what are you going to do with your three actions? Uh, okay, so I would like to uh, put the bow up, draw the katana, and run forward. Okay. Uh, I don't think that's using the dynamic actions yet, has it? Or, or... Uh, hmm. If you're running to engage, uh, if, if that, you know, that, that could be one action, but if you have a specific target in mind... Uh, like if you see one of your clan members is, is fighting another one, you can rush in and attack that one as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you have a specific target, you can essentially rush forward and attack, but that would become part of your description, which I would say speed, obviously, would be one of your skills you would use. Um, well, one of the things I definitely want to do this turn is use uh, Flame Arrow. Okay. That I have that Jutsu. All right. Target one of the uh, carriages. Okay. So we haven't seen any people, any of the Hanos come out of the, uh, the carriages yet, have we? No, you haven't. Okay. So I'd like to target, uh, let's say, the front carriage of the two. All right. So uh, you're going to be activating this Jutsu. So go ahead and tell me what's your activation role for that one. Uh, okay. So it is Yang plus Marchman. Uh, because I am fire in nature, I should get a plus one to that. All right. Uh, okay, so uh, you need to roll your activation. Now, it will still kick off even if you fail your activation, but th you'll have the backlash happen if you fail it. Okay. So. Uh, okay, I got uh, and a boost. So, so uh, an 8 and a 0. Um, All right, so that's going to be 3 total. And I, It's just a basic jutsu. So yeah, basic it, jutsu, it so you, uh, you succeeded. And uh, at this point, so your jutsu goes off. Does the write-up on it say that you need to make an attack uh, roll with it or anything else, or does it just go off? It says you fire a flaming arrow from your palm, dealing 2 damage on a successful hit. Okay. Uh, on a boost, the target suffers a burn one condition, and oh. it says on a boost you can choose whether or not to ignite the point of contact. Okay. Uh, so I'm definitely going to want to make this fire as big as possible. All right. All right. So uh, go ahead and, uh, if you'd like, describe uh, how this goes off. As always with the jutsu, uh, jutsus always have a physical element to them. They do. They affect the environment. They're very visual, very flashy. So what would they? What, what would people see? All right. So uh, I'm going to sling my bow across my shoulders, and I walk up. Uh, I'm going to be uh, sort of doing this. Uh, these kind of martial artsy gestures uh, and as that happens these concentric closing rings of uh, of orange light start to start to uh, focus on my hand and then I hold my left hand out flat and uh, this little arrow of fire about 12 inches long shoots out of it and hits this carriage and just explodes with fire and, and catches uh, my side of the carriage on fire. Okay. All right. So, yeah, you the arrow strikes the carriage and just ignites fire uh, all over the side of it. Uh, possibly, you know, because it is a carriage and uh, likely has some very high end materials that's made out of. It catches like tinder, and that entire side uh, is just burning. You hear scrambles from the inside, and people are now fleeing the carriage out the other side of the carriage, away from you, away from the fire. Uh, the carriage in back, also now, uh, people seeing this and seeing that this battle is going to go south on their side, they begin to stream out of it, and you see that this is uh, likely the Hano's family. This is uh, going to be wife's uh you know a wife his children and possibly servants running away from the other carriage uh in total coming out on your side are three people and they're fleeing uh fleeing outwards in a way uh running in towards the fields but of course all the mass combat is happening as well 
so uh, your clan members continue to fight. There is an individual uh, who seems very disciplined, and he is holding his own right now against three members of your clan. Uh, it, it's as if while he is... It's, it, there's a certain level of skill with him. Like, he is incredibly skilled with the sword and is taking three people to be equal to him in skill. Uh, it, but there's something else to it. There's a certain amount of tactics to it. And you're li- you see that what could be going on is that he is making himself a distraction. He, it's as if he is drawing people to fight him and, you know, taking up as much resources for your side as possible for some reason. Uh, this, of course, in your mind, and also because you know that they have bases in this area, in your mind, something screams that this person is probably a silver blade. Okay. So, uh, go ahead and roll your dynamic dice. Let's see what happens. Uh, what success? One success. So you will have two act. Oh, actually, you still have other actions from this previous round. I don't. We'll, sa- we'll save those. So you'll have two actions in a moment. But you still have two actions from the previous round. You got your jutsu off. You still have two more things. What would you like to do from the previous round? So um, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to draw my katana. And I'm going to keep rushing forward. This whole silver blades thing. Mm-hmm. Um, if I get tied up in that, that I'm gonna miss out on on the revenge. Yeah. Um, and uh, gonna, I'm gonna, you know, focus on the uh, the objective. And, and if if he holds up people or kills people, then that's their problem, not my problem. Um, so uh, I'm gonna charge at this uh, at this family as they're fleeing. Uh, the carriage that's not that's not on fire. Mm-hmm. And uh, can I can I get to them, or are there people in my way? Uh, I will say that if you wish to uh, use one action to get to the nearest one, uh, that will take up one action, and you'll be able to do that without having to worry about running into uh, you know you'd be able to avoid the other combats taking place. And then your last action would be an opportunity to attack. Um, yeah, I'll uh, I'll do that then. I'll I'll slip by the uh, the combat and I will get to um, let's say uh, I guess the wife probably. Um, okay. So uh, at that point, uh, what two skills are you going to use to attack? I think uh, I'd be fighting in speed, probably. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty good combo for me. All right. And uh, yeah, I'm, I just come up and uh, no, no explanation, no preamble. Just gonna just slash. Is three successes, one of which is a, or, you know, it's a, it's a nine and a, uh, a boost. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, so, I forget what all boost gets. Uh, in this game, it's one of those things where uh, all that does is count as a additional, you know, the additional success. So, uh, boosting is this one of the mistakes that I made calling it in the original game because I've been playing other games that used a D10 system. So essentially all it is is you, you've gotten three successes. So, uh, And then basically a dynamic dice can be used for other actions and so can karma. Cool. So. Uh, yeah, so three successes on that attack. Alright. Uh, you slice along uh, her back and she falls to the ground crying out. Uh, appearing in front of this group, a uh, young woman of the recoiling serpent group uh, strikes down uh, one of the children that was running. And it's as if she, you appeared behind them, she appeared in front of them, and now there is only the wife and uh, one other 
possibly either uh, one of a, a concubine or possibly uh, a servant that is standing there as well. Uh, but this is, you know, combat continues all around. Uh, it seems to be going your way uh, at this time. And, of course, Onimaru is just carving his way from the front end of the caravan. He's now made it to the first wagon and has already, with the troops that are massing at the front, they're just sweeping back towards y'all. So go ahead and roll your dynamic dice. Do we want to use that that other roll that I did? The, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we can two. go ahead and do that. And that you said you would have two actions this round. Okay. Um, so, uh, I am going to uh, grab this this girl, the servant girl, possibly. Mm-hmm. Um. Uh. Where is the? Well, what am I doing? I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna grab her, and and like pick her up a little bit by the front of her, uh, her tunic or kimono or whatever she's wearing. Mm-hmm. As I throw her up against the side of the, uh, the side of the carriage and say, "My family." You say what? Uh, I say, "Where's the head of the Hanos family?" And she looks over at the burning carriage. Uh, So her eyes betray her, uh, you know, basically looking into the carriage when you say that. Uh, So that that is your first action. What are you going to do with your second action? Um, I'm going to sort of drop her to the ground. She's not super important to me. And I'm going to run around the other side because uh, I saw there are people fleeing the carriage on the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, I see over there, does anybody look a, a likely person to be uh, important in this Hanos family? Yeah. You see, uh, yeah, uh, walking around the carriage, uh, you hear behind you, more than likely, the young uh, recoiling serpent, the woman that had come up, she basically strikes down the uh, handmaiden or whatever she was. You hear her scream and her scream silence uh, behind you as you walk around the carriage. But looking out, you see uh, three bodies of serpents on the ground, and you see an older gentleman wearing noble's clothing uh, running into the grass and you see, uh, also, it looks like there possibly is another figure running out ahead of him. Uh, you see the grass kind of splitting. I mean, it's tall reeds. And so there is definitely somebody there because the re- reeds are splitting, but you can't see who it is. So uh, go ahead and roll your dynamic dice and see what happens this time. Uh, one success. One success, so you will have two actions this round. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, I'm going to charge off after I'm uh, trying to try get this uh, this leader of the Hanos family. All right. Uh, let's go ahead. We'll make this a uh, contested roll between the two of you. Uh, what are you going to use to catch up with him? Uh, definitely speed. All right. And athletics. Speed athletics. All right. Uh, so your speed athletics, that's what he's going to do as well. I have one success. Okay. Uh, I have, oh my God. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight <laughs> wow. successes. Uh, so um, that is going to be, oh. let's go ahead and you just gained two karma. Nice. Uh, because you exceeded what you needed for this situation uh, by three twice. So, uh, so yeah, you now have a karma pool of three for this situation, and you are definitely going to catch up to him. What are you going to do with your next action? Uh, I would like to... Uh... Uh, uh... work on this this jutsu thing i'm gonna uh 
I'm gonna do uh, fire punch rather than, than going with my sword. I'm gonna work on that one. So uh, that is yank plus might. Oh, so, um, all right. And, and on those, so I've spent one yang already. Roll two yang, or do I roll one now that I've only got one left? Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go with two for right now. Uh, now you can also use a karma if you want to add that to the roll. For well, sure, I've got them. I might as well spend them. Yeah. All right. Oh no. <laughs> uh oh, what happened? It's the worst. I got four, four, three, five, one. So uh, that is a, a critical failure. All right. So uh, what that means is that you failed your activation roll for this jutsu. What, and so that means you get the backlash. What exactly does it say for when that happens? Uh, it says take damage intended for the target or set stuff on fire. Uh, also, I get a burn one condition. So... Oh. Um, Take the burn one. So yeah, so you're gonna have the burn condition, uh, which and I will choose to set stuff on fire. So the grasses around me are on fire now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so basically, what with the burn condition, that means that you are gonna suffer a one penalty, uh, a one dice penalty to uh, the level of the of it. So. Essentially, whatever your dice pool is for any other physical actions that you do, you're going to take away one dice. Okay, gotcha. All right. Uh, so the jutsu does not, uh, you know, you catch the entire area on fire. You get a burn one. I'm also going to say, though, that uh, it hits him as well. Uh, and he tosses off his... Uh, his jacket into the ground that has also caught fire and he turns to face you though uh you know basically takes up a very traditional uh you know stance and he is choosing to fight right All that right. is a bad decision for him but we'll <laughs> uh you know we'll, All right. uh, we'll see how it goes. so uh go ahead and roll your dynamic dice Alright. Uh, one success. Alright, so you have two actions. Uh, he will also have two actions this round. Uh, so, uh, we're gonna go ahead. I'm gonna let you go first. Uh, mm -hmm. just because my guess is your initiative is gonna be fed his, regardless. Uh, if I've got my katana out, I have an eight. Yeah. Definitely better than his. So, I figured with all your speed-based stuff. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, all right. So I'm gonna go. I'm, gonna, I'm just going in. I'm gonna attack. Um, and uh, I'm gonna go with fighting mm -hmm. and athletics, I guess. All right. And uh, do you have any specific description for what you're doing? Um, yeah, I'm going to, uh, I, I think I already had my sword drawn, but I'm going to sort of whip it around above my head, uh, as, as the grass around us blazes, burned and he is burned, uh, as I've just turned this, this field into an inferno, uh, I'm going to sort of leap, come down from, uh, from high overhead and, uh, and strike a killing blow first off. Okay. All right. So uh, go ahead and add one dice for that. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, okay. So. Are you going to add any karma to this roll? Um, you know, I don't think so. I, I hope I won't need it because I'm rolling 10 dice right now. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because um, I've got the Wildcat uh, fighting style where I get to add two fighting if I'm uh, acting first in a round. Okay. Which I guess I guess this counts as that. I don't guess yeah, oh yeah. No, that, that that this is it. Okay, cool. Um, uh, 
Uh, yeah, four successes out of that. Okay. You strike with your blade uh, across his chest, which has been, you know, just bared in this combat, and uh, it, it is a bloody wound. Uh, and it, unlike you, he does not have the ability to mold or shape key to avoid any of this. So uh, you have one more action if you want to try and strike him down before he attacks you. Uh, yes, I am. I'm absolutely going to press the attack. Mm-hmm. Boy. Uh, uh, fighting and might on this one. Okay. Uh, I've come down and I'm going to like sort of pivot and then sweep up and try and uh, where I am now that I've, I've sort of made him focus upwards. Uh, so okay, I've got four fighting might. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and add a karma as well. Okay. So that, that's the two that I've got or that I've got. I still have one left. I think. Okay. Uh, okay, that is three. Three successes on that one. Okay, and all right. All right. Your blade flashes again, uh, opening up a second ribbon of red across his chest, and the sword falls from his hand, and he buckles and falls forward onto his knees. Uh, he looks up to you, and, you know, with ragged breaths, is just looking at you and says, Why? And you have a, you have a moment. Are you just going to go ahead and strike him down? Uh, you can, basically, this is a moment where you can, uh, how would you like to do this? All right. Uh, so I will, uh, I will grab his, uh, his shirt uh, up at the shoulder right by his neck down right in front of him get real close and just say this is what happens when you betray the recoiling servants now I want to give him just a second if he's going to say anything there alright he's going to say anything go ahead and give me a empathy perception um Hey, three successes. Okay. That's pretty pretty. There is a look in his eyes of shock, possibly disbelief, uh, as if he does not understand what you're talking about. Okay. Uh, uh. But at, uh, okay. at the same time, oh, uh, the battle is raging on around you, uh, and Anumaru has made it almost back to the last carriage. Uh, this silver blade, you hear, uh, he does something, and with a quick step and a turn, slices through essentially all three swords of the swordsmen facing him, and the blades of their swords... Uh, you know, cut in half, springing out of their uh, grasp and into themselves. Uh, and this silver blade turns to face Onimaru. Well, um, I uh, I suspect that we've been lied to in some way, but uh, Saburo is not one to uh, hesitate. So I'm going to run this guy through. Okay. So just for good measure. Um, uh, All right, whip yeah. the sword out and get up and, and head back towards the main fighter. All right. Uh, at the same time, so you you run him through uh, the, the blade burying into him. The his face goes slack. The light goes out in his eyes, and he just slumps back, uh, sliding off your blade. The young, uh, uh, the other recoiling serpent that had acted alongside of you, she uh, appears at your side, pulls out a dagger, 
and throws it at uh, whatever the form was moving through the grass besides him. And she just throws it, and you hear it find purchase, and you hear a scream out in the grass. And she nods to you and continues out after whatever it was. Um, do I know her at all, or no? You've never met her before, but, uh, you know, it's obvious that she is quite capable as well. Uh, but at this point, is there anything else you're going to do? Because, uh, they're essentially everyone's going to be gathering around Onimaru in this Silver Blade. Uh, they're about the, he is about the only one left from this, con- from this, uh, caravan that is still alive. Um... I think at this point I would um, uh, sheath the katana, grab the bow again, I'd be making my way back over to them, and uh, as I'm making my way over, I'd like to try and dip another arrow in this poison, see how much I can get out of it. Okay. And uh, then if... uh, if it seems feasible, I'd like to climb up on the not burning carriage and try and get on its roof. One of the situation. All right. So you're climbing on the roof of uh, one of the wagons. Uh, the uh, the carriage that I that the wife and the uh, okay, so one not on fire. fire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So that that'll be uh, your action then. Uh. Essentially, it looks like Tony Maru and this Silver Blade are going to square off. Uh, they trade a few uh, a few quick blows. Uh, nobody landing anything. The you know it, it's a battle between two people who are highly skilled. Uh, Tony Maru it seems unfazed and. This silver blade looks around the group. I mean, he knows he is surrounded. Uh, is there anything you're going to do, or are you just watching at this point? Um, I've got that arrow drawn, and uh, I'm just I'm kind of looking for an opening that if I can shoot this guy in the back, um, take it, because, you know, fair fights are, are for suckers. <laughs> um I'd like to also uh, scan out back where that other reclaiming serpent was chasing down that person, mm-hmm. see if I can see anybody. Uh, I know the grass is very tall, though. Yeah. Uh, beyond the grass, uh, it looks like it, it opens up into a clearing, and there is a uh, tree, and you see a small child dragging themselves uh, into the clearing with a dagger sticking out of their back and you see that this is who the girl is walking towards um. <sighs> yeah, I uh... not a whole lot I can do about that She's, uh, she, or, or, and there's, I also don't think there's a whole lot Saburo would want to do about that. Um, so, to the, uh, to the main fight, I'm going to kind of try to divide my attention between the two. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, if it becomes clear that Onimaru is in any way in danger, uh, from the Silver Blade, I'd like to try and pop off a shot at him. Okay. Uh, the next, as the as it progresses, uh, the silver blade steps in to try and strike, and Onimaru catches the blade just below the hilt with his uh, sword, holding the blade aloft, and spews venom out into the face of the silver blade. Uh, the silver blade drops his sword and just starts clawing at his face. Uh, falling to the ground. A few chuckles uh, spread through the group just watching this. And after a few moments of suffering, uh, Onimaru just swings his sword and then swings it again to shake the blood off of it. And the man's head topples from his shoulders and he slumps to the ground. So... 
the combat is now at an end. Uh, is there anything else you're going to be doing? Um, if I look back over at the uh, the recalling serpent woman and this child, uh, you don't see uh, any movement from that direction, and you see her walking back towards you, wiping the blood from her dagger on uh basically on the sleeve of her kimono and she looks up at you and kind of shrugs and keeps walking back towards the rest of the group um if i could uh swing down and go over to uh how how on fire is this carriage that i set on fire now is it like totally gone it's not fully engulfed. Uh, if you approach from the side that is not on fire, you could at least look into it. But that's I'd like, to try and, I'd like to try and look in and see if I can see any effects, any papers, any... Uh, oh, yeah. No, there's, there's definitely several papers uh, and other things uh, on the carriage. In fact, there is a small chest, like... Uh, um, not not terribly big, like maybe a foot by one foot by one foot, and uh, so it's you know pretty much a square chest, uh, wooden with metal hinges. Uh, if I could nab that out of the uh, the carriage, that would be that yeah. would be what the group is interested in. Absolutely. So you grab it out and. Uh, eventually, the carriage is uh, just fully engulfed. Uh, the some of the members of the recoiling serpent, some of the members of this group, just spread out and try to cut free the horses and uh, you know, uh, dr- take them off. Uh, a few of them, I mean, it, especially the ones that are you know strung up to the carriage that's on fire, uh, they present too much of a risk and a danger to handle at this point. So, if, uh basically arrows fly into the two horses pulling it and they are killed. But, um, yeah, go ahead. All right. So what are you going to do? Uh, can I, can I get into this chest? Is it locked? No, it definitely has a large lock on it. Um, how would I go about picking that? Uh, I, I have no idea how that would work in this system. Uh, Pretty much, I mean, this is one of those things where you can attempt to pop it off if you, it's using skills, uh, as always, with any test. Uh, Some skills obviously aren't going to work well, uh, but this is one that I think that uh, possibly crafts and intuition or crafts uh, perception. This depends on how you choose to... uh, go about it but i definitely do think crafts uh knowledge of how these things might work would play into it right okay um yeah i could do crafts and intuition all right um and and i'll add a karma okay Um, yeah okay that'll be my last one for now yeah one success uh how many successes just one it does not pop open okay that's what I thought. Um, hmm. You uh, feel a, you, you basically a shadow passes over you, and uh, you turn and you look up, and standing right next to you is Onimaru. Um, hey, this is looking. Um, he's looking at you and looking at it. Um. So uh, I assume I sat down to do that or had it up against yeah. something. So I, I stand up and uh, say, uh, it's I who killed the head of the Hano. Uh, and uh, you know, I would go through his belongings, uh, try and get the chest open before you saw it. But uh, I don't have the right tools, or the lock is too complicated for me. He but, just, uh, his smile, he, he just smiles at you, but it's a very long, uh, 
almost very strange looking smile as if his mouth has more teeth than it should. But he reaches into his coat and pulls out a vial and he hands it to you and says, try this. Like pour it on the lock or drink it? Uh, pour it on the lock. Okay. Do you actually uh, do you actually say that to him? <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Saburo would know more okay, what yeah. to do. Just make just making um, sure. Sure, sure. I think Kenojo would say the the joke, but um, Saburo kind of uncorks it, takes a whiff, and uh, he'll set it on a, a carriage seat or something and, and pour it onto the lock. The lock begins to kind of boil and bubble. Uh, Obviously, this is some sort of strong acid. And it begins to eat through the metal. And uh, within moments, you could probably easily just pop the lock off at this, you know, at this point. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, you know, get a dagger on one side of it and pry it open. The lock pops off and you're able to now get into the chest. Um, so is, uh, is Onimaru, uh, standing by while I look at this stuff or is he yeah. going to, uh, he, he's just standing. I mean, he's standing there, uh, watching. Um, yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look through, see what's all in it. All right. You pop it open and it was deceptively heavy. Uh, the interior of it is padded with a velvet cloth. And inside are a series of badges, uh, gold badges with uh, the symbol of the royal palace. And Oni Mario says, ah, I suspected as much. If you don't mind, may I have one of those? Of course. It's all right. He this huh? takes it and slides it into the arm of his kimono. Thanks. I take it that you are the one who slew the head of the family. Yes. Excellent. Ah, uh, our clan's vengeance has been sated. For you, I will offer you something special. Do you wish to join my fangs? Would that be a full-time commitment, or am I free to move around as I please afterwards? Quite honestly, it is a full-time commitment. Joining the Fangs is joining our group, fighting out here with your brothers against the Empire. And I must respectfully decline, Omar. I have obligations elsewhere. Well, the invitation always stands. I need those who are willing to bury blades when a time comes. And he this bows slightly to you and walks away. Yeah, so um so we got we got badges of the Imperial House. Mm-hmm. For those of us who ha- you know for the for our audience uh listening to the show, these badges, these uh basically the symbols would be if you've listened to our main show, the golden badges that would be used to attend the duel that is taking place in Daiwa. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Saburo doesn't have any way to know what that is, though. No, he doesn't. This is um, this is one of those teasers yeah. where you as a player have a little bit of knowledge of stuff behind the scenes. Right. So try not to use it too much. But... <laughs> well, no. um, yeah, so... Uh... Okay, so is that all that's in here? Are there is there anything else in the chest, or is it just these, these yeah. badges? Just those badges. Uh, I mean, people begin to ransack through things. I mean, you have the opportunity to take trophies if you so wish. Uh, there are papers and other things as well in the other carriage. Uh, and, of course, all the items that were on the, uh, on the wagons that were leading this procession as well. So there's a, there's quite a bit here. Uh, is there anything your character would want to take as a trophy, such as even the sword from uh, the head of the Hana family? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, I'd, I'd go up back to the body mm-hmm. uh, of the Hano and um, uh, at, at least take his sword. Uh, I burned his his outer jacket, so um, that's probably gone. Yeah. 
Uh, there is a, you know, a velvet bag that's hanging on his side. Uh, you know, it would be wrapped in with his belt. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go through that as well. Okay. So uh, there are personal effects, uh, mainly. Uh, a few, there's money, there are a few small trinkets. Uh, there is also a house seal. Uh, okay, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely take that. And, uh, can I go to the, uh, the wagons and see if there's a shovel in there? Yeah, sort of absolutely. Realize the about Seguro. Yeah. Um, uh, go out. Oh, go ahead. No, I'll let. We'll go ahead and say, yeah, sure. There's a shovel. Uh, you know, they, people need to uh, dig pits for many different reasons uh, while they move across the country, either for privies or for you know places to build fires. Um. Yeah. So I'm gonna dig. I'm gonna grab a shovel and uh, going to go out where this uh, this child was and this child was killed. Mm-hmm. I'm going to uh, find him uh, or her. Okay. Uh, which, which is it? Uh, it, it appears to be a young boy. Um, so uh, Saburo is going to uh, just start digging a small, uh, small grave and uh, takes essentially and uh, then he's gonna to lay the child as gently as he can in there, and uh, ooh, I like that. Uh, he is going to uh, put Father's sword in the grave with him, and then he's gonna start covering it up. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's that's what he's gonna do. All right, and I think that that might be a good note to end on, unless there's anything else that you definitely wanted to do. Uh, we're not going to be able to travel back at this point. We'll probably, if we have more sessions for our other group, uh, you know, our other team, we'll probably deal with aftermath from this situation. But other than that, I think this is a good point to go ahead and end it. Uh, do you have anything else that you did want to do while you're out there? Um, no, I think I'm good. I think I'm just going to start making my way back. And I, I don't think I'm necessarily going to like check in with anybody else either. I think I'm just headed out from here and I'm going to go back to Dunketsu even. Because uh, the other recording serpents, that's not like a permanent thing. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and call the game there. And we, I really hope that everybody enjoyed themselves with this little uh, teaser and a uh, link back to our other team, as well as other ways in which the plot is progressing all across the Empire. So uh, thank you guys and take care.